relationships for you to grow in your relationship with Christ and to become more like Christ. If you came prepared to give this morning, you can do that in two ways. First, if you're worshiping online with us, click the link labeled giving in your description box. If you're worshiping with us in the sanctuary, go ahead and drop your offering in the box in the lobby on your way out. If you're new with us, please don't feel any need to give. We're just glad you're here. And at the end of our service today, we will be participating in communion together. So we invite you now to gather your communion supplies. If you're watching online, take this minute to gather some juice and crackers. And if you're in the sanctuary, you can find your supplies in the back of the pew in front of you. So it's time for our Get to Know You segment. And Danielle, I have a question. What's the most favorite class that you've ever taken? I would have to say my veterinary medicine class that covered zoo life and exotics. That's exciting. Um, I would have to say for me, it was a Shakespearean literature class where we did all Shakespeare all semester. Oh, I love that. <laughs> what about you? What's your answer to the question this morning? Go ahead and turn to your neighbor and share. We're excited to worship with you here and we'll see you in 60 seconds. Good morning, ECC. It is a beautiful day to worship our Lord. Let's stand together as we sing with Glorious Day. I was buried beneath my shame. And who could care? It was my tomb till I met you. Oh, I was breathing but not alive. And all my failures I tried to hide. It was my tomb till I met You called my name and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness into your glorious day. You called my name and I ran out of that grave, out of darkness. 
it. Let's sing out our redemption story right here, right now. I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my My name is Kristen Mueller, and I'm the director of Children's Ministries here at ECC. And we are glad that you are here with us in worship this morning. Um, and we would love to know that you are here with us. So if you could take a moment to fill out our online communication card, you'll find that linked in the Bible app and on the worship page of our website. So go ahead and mark that you are here with us, whether you're in the room or online. Now, our children's ministry classes are now open for birth through fifth grade. So if you have nursery, preschool, or kindergarten kids, you are welcome to check them in at the start of worship or at any time during the service. Um, that's where you'll check them in each week at the west entrance. But then if you have a first through fifth grader, your kids are probably still sitting with you. Right. And Melissa Moore's newest study, Now That Faith Has Come, which is a study of Galatians. Um, you can find details about the studies, including the workbook that you need to purchase and the link to register on the ECC Connect page. Your RSVP is greatly appreciated as we are making final plans for these studies. And also this week we have a flower picking event at 21 Petals on Saturday. So you can come and buy a bucket and pick your own flowers, or you can sign up to split a bucket with a friend. Um, you can visit ecclife.net slash connect for more information on these events and to sign up. And we are so excited that ECC volunteers are able to go back into Miller Elementary School this year. And there are a variety of ways that we can sign up to help in the classroom, in the library, at lunch or recess, or in several other areas. But a pressing need right now is to help with the family dinners that we host at Miller. Beginning, If you're interested in volunteering at Miller, please sign up today at ecclife.net slash connect. And Rhonda will be in touch to discuss what might be the best fit for you. As we continue on in worship, let us stand. We'll start with King of Kings. In the darkness we were Without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Salvation. 
salvation. Jesus, for our sake, you died. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, Till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Gospel truth of old shall not heal, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me.
Would you pray with me? We praise you, Jesus, that you have paid our debt. And we thank you, as Pastor Stacy said last week, that you resurrect us to be something different, something more, something better than we could be on our own. You resurrect us to be, some, to be who we were really created to be. So forgive us for trying so hard in our own strength to know more rather than to be more of what you're calling us to be. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would lead us to what that means for us individually and as a congregation, draw us more and more, one step at a time, to the real life in the here and now for which you gave your life. We thank you for the example of Jesus who laid down his life for his friends, and he laid down his life for those who didn't agree with him, and even for those who hated him. And in our divided and polarized world, show us how to be your people who listen and care for not only our friends, but with those with whom we disagree. Jesus, you showed us how love breaks down barriers. In Galatians, it says, what is important is faith expressing itself in love. Give us love in our faces, in our words, so that we can rightly represent you to the world where we live. Father, today we grieve with many in our congregation who are grieving. We lift up Susie Johnson and April Mark Wiley as, along with their families as they navigate the new reality of life without Max and Bill. We also lift up Pete and Sherry Hillsammer after Pete's mother's passing and Scott and Jane Warner after the loss of their daughter, Cassandra. Father, we just pray that each one of them would be aware of your comforting presence and provision in these days. And may sweet moments come to them, each one, as they remember and memories come back to mind. We just pray for your comfort for them, and we pray that you would show us what it means to love them in this time. We also ask for your provision and power in the ministry of Travis and Sharon Garrison, who serve you in the Middle East. Uh, be with their family as they are busy with young children. Just protect and guide them in their ministry, we pray. We also pray for your protection on Austin Hurl, Lisa Kirkman's nephew who serves us in the Marines, and we ask for his safety and encouragement in his walk with you. And as school gets started and another mops year begins, we pray for Jennifer Hart and Mandy Hill Willis as they lead mops and mops next. 
Um, we pray that you would bring pre previous moms and new moms who need the community and opportunities to know your generous love to them while they parent. We just thank you for that ministry and the encouragement it is to so many moms. And as fall Bible studies begin, we ask for your blessing on and guidance for Kate uh, and all of the women's ministry team. Just pray that you would use their efforts to draw us together as people who are transformed and are being transformed um, in our journeys with you. And then I lift up again Pastor Stacy, that you would give him your words for us today and that our hearts and minds would be open to receive and to uh, have a new perspective on your call in our life. Just pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. If there are any first through fifth graders who would like to come up and join us on the steps, we'll be heading out to the great room to see the rest of that story. And this video gives you a glimpse. You can come forward now if you'd like our first through fifth graders and just stand on the steps. But this video gives you a glimpse into the lessons that we do each week with our elementary kids. It's the intro video for our lesson. And if you are worshiping online or if you're staying in the room, you can find the rest of the story at ecclife.net slash kids. Um, you just follow the age group and you can find the videos for the week. But if you're coming to class with us, you're going to see the rest of that story in the great room as we figure out what to do when we see something that needs to be done. Hmm. And follow the story of Nehemiah all month long. So parents, you'll pick your kids up in the great room at the end of worship. And um, as we dismiss, we're going to give a blessing to our congregation, and they're going to bless us right back. So we're going to say, peace be with you, and then the congregation will say back, and also with you. So on the count of three, you'll say, peace be with you, all right, to our congregation out here. Ready? One, two, three. Peace be with you. Let's head out.
Good morning. Today's scripture reading is Genesis 2, 21 to 3, 10. So the Lord God create, caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, said the serpent. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together, made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called out to them, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. That is the word of the Lord. Good morning. So before we uh, jump in this morning, uh, let me just inform you of a, of a couple of things. First of all, I know that many of us uh, have been concerned about the earthquake that uh, happened in Haiti a couple weeks ago, maybe looking for a way to give toward that. So uh, if you were interested in doing that, I want to direct you to an organization called Covenant World Relief. Covenant World Relief is one of our denominational uh, partnerships in the larger Covenant Church for relief and development. There are two ways that you can connect to them. First, I put a link in the Bible app live event. If you scroll down past the scripture reading, you'll see it right there. You can click there and go and give that way. Um, the second is, if you fill out the digital communication card each week, and I hope you do, it gives us a record of, of your attendance as a way for you to get connected to a few things. If you, uh, once you have checked that you're present, if you scroll down to the bottom, you can check a box there that says that, uh, um, that you'd like to get our e-letter. You should all be getting our e-letter. It comes out once a week, comes out on Tuesdays, and this week's will have a link to Covenant World Relief and how you can give as well. Finally, we are in our second week in this uh, new series where your guest is almost as good as mine in terms of what I'm going to preach on from week to week. Uh, the, uh, the image of deeper water reminds us of our passage from last week, Luke 5, verses 1 through 11, where Jesus told his first disciples who were fishermen, even though they were tired and hadn't caught anything all night, to go out into deeper water and let down their nets for a catch. And we are taking that image of deeper water and using it as a metaphor that calls upon us all to pursue our own transformation in partnership with the Holy Spirit. So each week I'm going to spend time in prayer seeking God about what message, what word he might have for us, and I invite you to pray along uh, with me on that, and to sign up for our daily scripture emails if you haven't done that already. Same place, you go to the digital communication card and scroll down, you can check a box that says you want to get those. It's 10 to 15 verses a day. I have started putting a couple of sentences at the beginning of it to tell you what to look for. I have created a little monster, and now I must feed it. So uh, if you'd like to get that, you can sign up for those uh, daily scriptures as well. Join me with now just a, a moment of silence as we make space, sacred space, for God's word this morning. God, we thank you for this time and space and this group of people as we come together. We thank you for your word that you have given us. We thank you for your spirit that is present with us and in us. And we ask, God, now that you would 
Anoint me as I bring this word. Add to, take away as you see fit. Anoint each of us as we hear that whatever you might have for us would stick, God, would speak to us what you desire would, would happen, Lord, would happen in our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's an episode of the NPR podcast, Hidden Brain. It deals with what they refer to as a scarcity mindset. It's a few years old, but I've, I've linked that webpage in the podcast in the Bible app live event as well. And the webpage introduction to the episode opens with these written remarks. Have you ever noticed that when something important is missing in your life, your brain can only seem to focus on that missing thing? Two researchers have dubbed this phenomenon scarcity, and they say it touches on many aspects of our lives. And then quoting from one of the researchers, the host, Sean Comperdanum, says, it leads you to take certain behaviors that in the short term help you, wait a minute, that in the short term help you to manage scarcity, but in the long term only make matters worse. Now, the episode deal, deals primarily with very real scarcity, not imagined. It helps us to understand the scarcity mindset among those who are under-resourced in the, in the world and why they sometimes make what appear to us to be uh, bad mistakes in terms of decisions that they make. There is real scarcity, and then there is perceived scarcity. Those times when we perceive that we do not have enough of something we desperately need or desperately want, and we manage to deal with this perceived scarcity in ways that only hurt us and others. We do not believe that enough is enough. And so we strive for more. And that striving can dominate all of our thinking. For those of us who feel that way about life, all the shine of a thousand spotlights, all the stars we steal from the night sky will never be enough. We're always looking for more. I've used this story before, but it fits. I'm going to use it again, and I'll probably use it again in the future. America's first billionaire, John D. Rockefeller, was once asked how much money is enough, and his answer famously was, just a bit more. For him, enough was not enough, good enough was not good enough, rich enough was not rich enough, powerful enough was not powerful enough. So in our passage this morning, we're going to be taken to a place where most of us, if we grew up in the church, first learned about how sin came into the world, the nature of sin, how it became a part of the world, how it has impacted our world and all of life. The first man and the first woman, later known as Adam and Eve, go against God's commandment not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, even though they are permitted to eat from any other tree in the garden, and especially the tree of life. Imagery of the tree of life pops up a few more times in the pages of Scripture. The imagery of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil does not. We don't actually know exactly what it was. Or what it means. And that, of course, is beside the point. The point is that early on in the creation story, God gave humanity provision for all their needs, permission to eat of that provision, meaningful work, a sense of community, marriage, family, intimacy with God, relationship with God. God gave all of that and one prohibition. They had everything they would ever need but it wasn't enough. And we know the story. The first couple sinned. They gave in to the serpent's temptation and they violated that one prohibition not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so in Christian history and theology, we talk about original sin. But this incident, this event doesn't happen until Genesis 3. Genesis 1 and 2 speak to us of original blessing or original goodness, what, what God intended. That's where things started. But the most important part of this original blessing, this original goodness, is the first couple's relationship with God. They fellowshiped with God. The Garden of Eden is considered paradise, not only because all of our physical needs are met, but also because, or mainly because, God was present and they could commune with God. They could fellowship with God. So long before the birth of Jesus, and in a different way, of course, God was Emmanuel, God with us, even in the Garden of Eden. And it was enough. It was enough. As commentator Paul Borgman puts it here, God and the couple are apparently accustomed to visiting together in a state of easy harmony. Paradise is more than having all of our needs met. It is knowing God. It is walking with God. It is enjoying and thriving in the reality that God is with us. 
And this is the way God intended to relate to us and have us relate to him. So put another way, although sin is and the sin nature is indeed fundamental to who we are as human beings, grace and blessing and God's presence with us are even more fundamental to who we are as human beings. Yes, sin is fundamental to who we are, but even more fundamental are grace and blessing and God's desire to be present with us. We see God's blessing and grace at work in several different ways in the first few chapters of Genesis. When God decides that it is not good for the man to be alone, God creates animals and he brings them to the man. But then he decides that these aren't going to do for a companion. So God forms the woman from the side of the the man and brings her to him. Verse 23 of Genesis 2. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. This is a picture of a God who loves us and provides for us. When it was not enough simply for the man to be in relationship with God and to have the provision of the garden, God God created animals. When those were not enough, God formed the woman and brought her to him. And again, in this place, in this space, they have all they need and more. They have enough. They are enough. That's where things started. They have enough, that is, until something tempts them toward believing they don't. Until something plants in their minds and hearts the seeds of scarcity. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? I have heard, and perhaps you have too, uh, uh, people refer to Eden as perfect. The Garden of Eden was perfect. But it is only perfect if perfection contains within it the potential for imperfection, the freedom to rebel against God, the freedom to make poor choices. So among the creatures God has made is the serpent. And this dude is crafty. Again, to quote Paul Borgman, the serpent discovers and works to advantage the most subtle and sophisticated anxiety known to the human species. This is the fear that no matter how well endowed I am with all manner of personal and environmental good, it is not enough. Someone else has it better or is better. An uneasiness that gnaws like an aching tooth. Now, of course, the crafty serpent misquotes God. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. I think this is so subtle. Because I think think the serpent misquoted God on purpose. By doing so, the serpent engages the woman in conversation. In her pride, she is eager to show that she knows more than the serpent, and so she corrects him. When what she should have simply said was, how dare you, and walked away. Temptation is not something to engage in conversation. It is something to be fled. We see that over and over in the pages of Scripture. Once the woman replied to the serpent's lie, she was already well down the path towards sin. Furthermore, hopefully you notice this, she adds to God's words as well. And you must not touch it, she says, or you will die. God didn't say that. All God says, don't eat it. And here we have our first legalism. Our first legalism. God gives a prohibition. And humankind says, well, we want to make sure we never get close to breaking that one. So let's put another one on top of it. A rule that God did not make, but it's supposed to protect us. It's like when Pastor Kurt often says, and he's very fond of saying this, we can't do that, it might lead to dancing. (laughs) Legalisms, we put a human-made command on top of one of God's perfectly good prohibitions and we complicate things. The church is great at that. If any of you came of age in the 1990s among an evangelical church and the environment and all that, you may remember Joshua Harris's book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye. 
he reasoned, <clears throat> as he wrote this book at age 18, that if premarital sex was a sin, then we shouldn't even date. Legalism. Rules. Harris has since denounced the book, sold millions of copies. He's also stated that he no longer considers himself a Christian. You see, there's no need to add to God's commands. Simply know what God wants and obey. And while we might want to, in this modern age, get hung up on the problems with the talking snake, to paraphrase pastor and author Brian Zahn, it's not about whether the snake talked or not. It's about what the darn thing said. To focus on anything else is to miss the point. Verse 4. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Put another way, you're not enough. You're not enough. God, God is withholding something from you. It's yours. You need to take it back. And now she's hooked. It does not take long before she decides that, you know, maybe, maybe the serpent is right. Maybe God cannot be trusted to have her best interests at heart. Instead of being content with living into the design for which she was created, she wants to be more than she is. She experiences a perceived scarcity. How much is enough? Just a little bit more. Verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. <clears throat> now, I don't know if you noticed, but she has managed to find several different ways to rationalize her decision. It's now good for food. Oh, and it looks nice too. And... It's good for gaining wisdom. Nowhere does she admit what's really going on. She doesn't trust God. She doesn't trust God. Now it just seems reasonable. The only right thing to do is to disobey God. Clearly God is keeping something from humanity and we should take it back. What we have is not enough. Now, of course, let's... We can give the woman a little bit of credit here because at least it took her a bit. There was a little bit going on here and she processed it. When, but when she gave it to her husband, he just jumped in. She gave him some of the fruit and, quote, he ate it, verse 6 tells us. Not one word of objection. And now the first couple know something they did not know. Their eyes are open and they can see not just good and evil, but the evil within their own hearts. They know they have sinned, though that word never actually occurs here. They have truly committed an original sin, a sin that up to that point had never been committed before. And they are ashamed. Whereas before they were <clears throat> naked and unashamed, now at the, at, at the end of chapter 2, now they sew fig leaves together to cover themselves. Fig leaves. As if that's going to do the trick. But it seems they know it's not going to do the trick, so they hide from God. Verse 8. The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. That may seem like a weird place to stop what we're doing this morning, but we're going to stop there. We sometimes want to blame Adam and Eve for their pride here. They wanted to be like God, but God would not allow it. They, they sinned against God and they messed things up for all of us, but there are two things at least that we dare not forget that as we reflect on this passage. First, it's easy to call their sin pride and then just be done with them. Ah, that's the original sin. They wanted to be like God. But it's more than that. It's more complex than that. It's fear. It's anxiety. It's helplessness. It's vulnerability. And in those things that are very real to all of us, they fail to trust God and they choose to lean into the serpent's lies instead. Leads me to my second point. 
aside from all the doctrinal and theological discussions about original sin, I think it's incredibly important that we recognize that Adam and Eve in this passage are every man and every woman. They are every man and every woman. They are us. They, not only do they introduce sin into paradise, they introduce each of us to ourselves. They introduce each of us to ourselves and to the human condition. Their story is our story. Every single one of us, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Paul says in Romans 3. They are a portrait of each of us when we rebel against God. Their story is our story. Why do we sin? Because we do not trust God. Because we do not trust God. Because we are afraid and we are vulnerable and we are helpless and we are anxious just as they were. We sin because we do not believe we are enough and we do not believe God is enough either. According to Jacques Philippe, author of the book Interior Freedom, when negative or difficult things happen to us in life or when we perceive that things are not going the way we hoped, prayed, planned they would, or thought we deserved, we really have three choices. First, rebellion. Rebellion. There are times, of course, when rebellion against something is entirely right, some injustice, some wrong that's been done that needs to be righted, for example. But what Philippe is actually talking about here when he speaks of rebellion is rebellion as rejection of reality. Rebellion as rejection of reality. Rebellion of this nature, he says, quote, only increases and spreads the wrong it, it aims to remedy. And this is the case with Adam and Eve. As we continue in the pages of Genesis, sin spreads. Their son Cain kills his brother, and it just, it's just downhill from there. All the way to get to chapter 6 when God grieves that he even put humankind on the earth. Rebellion or resignation. Resignation. Now, resignation is better than rebellion. At least it recognizes reality. It doesn't deny it. But in the end, it is actually characterized by hopelessness and despair and powerlessness. We just stop caring. This is the way it is. Rebellion, resignation, and then a third option, consent. Consent. If we choose consent, Philippe says, quote, we say yes to a reality we initially saw as negative because we realize that something positive may arise from it. Can you hear the trust in God there? We say yes to a reality we initially saw as negative because we realize that something positive may arise from it. In doing so, we have hope that God can and does work in difficult and negative circumstances anyway. And then as he continues, Jacques Philippe seems to be speaking directly of what did not happen in the Garden of Eden. He says, we can, for example, say yes to what we are in spite of our feelings because we know God loves us. We trust that out of our deficiencies, the Lord is capable of making splendid things. We trust that out of our deficiencies, the Lord is capable of making splendid things. We consent to what we did not choose because as Teresa of Lisieux says, we believe that, quote, love is so powerful that it is able to draw good out of everything, both the good and the bad that it finds in me. Love is so powerful that it can draw good out of everything. Our consent, this is important, our consent is not consenting to the situation. It is consenting to God's presence God's work and God's goodness in the midst of the situation. It is choosing to trust God rather than rebel against God or resign to things in hopelessness. To consent, to consent is true freedom. We can let go of trying to fix everything or trying to rebel or just giving up and we can trust that somehow God is at work in these things. It may, in fact, bring something very splendid out of it. We hear the Apostle Paul choosing consent in 2 Corinthians 12. There, Paul speaks about his thorn in the flesh. He was, <clears throat> he was given. He does not elaborate on it. And while no one really knows for certain, scholars have suggested it might have been an eye ailment, it might have been epilepsy, it might have been malaria, it might have been persecution, just to name a few. 
<clears throat> it is clear, whatever it was, Paul would rather not have to deal with it, right? He refers to it as a <clears throat> messenger of Satan sent to torment me. Then he adds, verse 8, I pleaded with the Lord three times for it to leave me alone. He said to me, my grace is enough for you because power is made perfect in weakness. So I'll gladly spend my time bragging about my weaknesses so that Christ's power can rest on me. Therefore, I'm all right with weaknesses, insults, disasters, harassments, and stressful situations for the sake of Christ. Because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. What Adam and Eve missed and Paul discovered in Christ was true freedom in consenting to their reality and trusting that God's grace was more than enough and that good could in fact come from it, all of it. And you and I would do well to discover this too. The call of the gospel is not only to know that eternal life with God is secure, but to live into that eternal life even now, to receive all that God has for us in the here and now in Christ Jesus and to know that what God has for us is enough. What God has for us is enough. What Adam and Eve did not realize or, choose to, or chose not to embrace was the reality that they were enough. That God was enough. That they needed nothing else. They and we are loved by God just as we are. We are enough. But allow me to talk out of both sides of my mouth. We are enough, but we are not enough. We are not enough to save ourselves. We are not enough to transform ourselves. We need a savior, a teacher, an example. And that savior is Jesus. And he is indeed enough as well. And when we fail... When we fall, when we sin against God and our neighbors, God's grace demonstrated to us in and through Jesus Christ is enough. It's more than enough. So let's go to deeper waters this morning. Let's, let's choose consent over rebellion and resignation. And as we close, I invite you to consider some area of your life that is not the way you want it to be. Some relationship, some lack, some scarcity some wrong, some injustice, perhaps an illness, even the death of a loved one. Some place where life is not enough. We all have these realities at work in our lives that speak to us of the imperfections of life on planet Earth. What is yours? I'm trying to decide whether to do something here. Um, so in the coming weeks, you're going to... What ha the stuff I learned on sabbatical is going to leak out. Sometimes I'll tell you this is where this comes from. Sometimes I won't. Uh, it's, you're going to see it, I hope. One of the, as I hinted last week, one of the things that came out during uh, sabbatical was me discovering things about myself that I do not like. And um, one of those things is, as I'm getting older, I've discovered I have issues with anxiety. Never. I mean, I can go back to third grade and I can picture an anxious me, but it's getting worse. I don't like it. I don't like who I am. I can't. When I get, we were driving up Cape Cod. Kim should probably tell this story. Listening to an audio thing of what the history of Cape Cod and Cape Cod. This is like a metaphor. Cape Cod, if you've ever been there, just gets smaller and smaller the further you go up. Right, Todd? Small, skinny as you get to the top of it. And the streets get closer. Kim's driving, I'm sitting in the passenger seat. I'm not in control. This is important. We go down Commercial Avenue. Everybody says you have to go down Commercial Avenue. <clears throat> Artists, restaurants, <clears throat> and lots of people. One-way street, cars parked on both sides, people walking everywhere, not even looking where they're going, bicycles coming the opposite way. I become a jerk. I become the most difficult human being to live with in the world. M maybe Hitler would be worse, but <clears throat> I am like angry and yelling, and, and it's all anxiety. Because what I've learned is when I get angry, and I do, the question I have to ask is, what is making me anxious right now? 
I can rebel against my anxiety, I can resign myself to my anxiety, or I can give God consent. So in silence, I want you to prayerfully consider one area in your life that is not going as you wish. One area. You may come up with ten. That's fine too. Let's just sit for a moment in silence. I'm going to just allow that, whatever it is, to come to your mind. Now I want to lead you all in the welcoming prayer by Father Thomas Keating. To be clear, when we welcome difficult things in this prayer, we are not saying they are okay or right or good. Not at all. We are saying they are a reality. They are a reality. They are part of our lives, and because of that, they belong. To deny them or to ignore them will only do us harm. So as I pray this prayer very slowly over you, I would invite you, phrase by phrase, word by word, to repeat after me silently or whisper it out loud if you'd like to. It's also in the Bible app so that you can take it with you this week. So again, a few seconds of silence, and then I will lead us in the welcoming prayer. And again, holding before you that thing that came to mind, that relationship, that situation, that injustice, that wound, whatever it is. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I welcome everything that comes to me in this moment. Because I know that it is for my healing. I welcome all thoughts, feelings, emotions, persons, situations, and conditions. I let go of my desire for security. I let go of my desire for approval. I let go of my desire for control. I let go of my desire to change any situation, condition, person, or myself. I open to the love and presence of God and his healing, action, and grace within. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We welcome everything that comes to us in this moment because we know that these things are for our healing. We welcome all thoughts, feelings, emotions, persons, situations, and conditions. We let go of our desires for security. We let go of our desires for approval. We let go of our desires for control. We let go of our desires to change any situation, condition, person, or ourselves. We open to the love and presence of God and his healing action and grace within. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters worshiping with us this day. I pray that whatever area of life and lack that you brought to mind for them that they are able to truly consent and allow you to work. We pray, God, that in and through these things we will discover that we can indeed trust you, that you are enough, that you are more than enough. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. It is now our sacred privilege to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. All of us who humbly put our trust in Christ and desire his help that we may lead holy lives, all of us that are truly penitent for our sins and want to be delivered from them, all that desire to walk in love with our neighbors, 
and intend to live new lives following the commandment of God and walking from this day forward in his holy ways, we are all invited to draw near by faith and take part in this sacrament. So come to the sacred table, not because you must, but because you may. Come to testify, not that you are righteous, but that you sincerely love our Lord Jesus Christ and that you desire to be his true disciples. Come not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Not because you have any claim on the grace of God, but because in your frailty and sin, you stand in constant need of his mercy and help. Come not to express an opinion, but to seek his presence and pray for his spirit. Join with you now as we pause for a moment of silence and confessing our sins to God, and then join me in the corporate prayer of confession. Let's pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. If we confess our sins, our God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. May Almighty God have mercy on us all, forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of his Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ as they've been delivered to us by the Apostle Paul. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took the bread and when he blessed it and broke it, And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. The same way, after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Lord of all, we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you as we present to you these gifts from your creation. Gracious God, we pray that you will send your spirit upon them, that you will send your spirit upon these gifts, that they may be to us the sacrament of the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they may be to us a reminder of the new covenant you have made with us in Jesus. Unite us to your son in his death and resurrection so that we might be acceptable through him sanctified by the Spirit. And in the fullness of time, God, we pray that you would put all things in subjection under Christ, that you would bring us to that heavenly feast where all your saints will be gathered in glory everlasting through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation, by him and with him and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This cup is the new covenant in the blood of Christ shed for you. Drink of it, all of you. (coughs) 
Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Would you pray with me? God of the ages, we praise you for all your servants who, having witnessed to you on earth, now live with you in heaven, remembering especially before you today our brother, Max Johnson. Keep us in fellowship with all of them until we meet with all the faithful in the joy of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we sing these last two songs, um, I want to kind of explain the first one. Um, this is a newer song called Jira, and it comes from Genesis 22, where um, Abraham is sacrificing his son Isaac, and at the last minute, the Lord sends a ram, and he doesn't end up sacrificing his son, and Abraham calls the place where this happened um, the mountain of the Lord it will be provided, which is in Hebrew, Jehovah Jira. And so this song is called Jaira, and it's all about God's provision for us, how he is enough, and there's a few spots in this song where we sing it over and over again. So stand with me, and let's proclaim these truths over and over again as we repeat sections of this song. never be more loved than I am right now wasn't holding you up so there's nothing I can do to let you down it doesn't take a trophy to make you proud I'll never be more loved than I am right now going through a storm
Thanks for joining us for worship. Receive the benediction. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God, the Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace. Yeah, your grace is enough.